Today, I'm speaking with Kelsey Gallert. Kelsey, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. And Kelsey lives in St. Joseph, Michigan. That's a part of the country I've never been to, but uh, I'd love to hear what that life is like there. And then she and her husband have been married for 14 years, and they have a 10-year-old son and a 5-year-old daughter, as well as a Burmese mountain dog and a small Shiba Inu. And she works in the nuclear industry, and she's also an avid runner and swimmer. She grew up in a mainstream evangelical environment with a touch of Pentecostalism, but as an adult, she moved through independent fundamental Baptist influences and even tour observance and Hebrew roots movements, which is I, I know a little bit about, but I'd love to hear more details about that. So that's what I know about you so far. Before we get into the details of your story, can you tell us more about yourself? Uh, um, well, in this season of life, everything just revolves around the kids, really. So it's a lot of um, baseball and football and basketball for my son and ballet and gymnastics and swimming for my daughter. Um, that's really it. Uh, and we love our dogs. We're always busy with our dogs. And mm. yeah, just chugging along with the little ones. Does a mountain dog shed a lot? Oh my gosh, they both shed horribly, horribly. Mm. Vacuum every day. Yeah, we have a um, a black lab and she her hair. Just, you don't even see it in our carpet, but when you vacuum, you really, or, or use the wet, wet vac, you really see it pull up. It's like, ugh. Yeah. And what does it mean to, that you work in the nuclear industry? What do you actually do? Um, so there's a nuclear plant nearby here, and I have always been in the administration uh, side of things. So I am um, administrative assistant, and then I moved into corrective actions. So it's really just helping other people um, as they get their go in and get their hands dirty working in the machinery and the equipment for the nuclear power. I'm always uh, nice and comfy in the offices, helping them with whatever they need gotcha. outside of the equipment. Are you familiar with the, the cartoon show, The Simpsons? Mm. The, the main really. character at Homer, he he was a, a nuclear operator, and but he was like the most sloppy, laziest person, and so he, he would like end up walking home with accidentally like a a whatever the plutonium rod or something. You know, yeah. the guy caught in his shirt, <laughs> and you know it was about to blow up, and he you know wouldn't push the right button. But anyway, it's funny funny show. And what is last question? What is uh, St. Joseph, Michigan like? Is it cold up there? Um. Yes, we. Oh, gosh, we it really feels like we only have two months of like truly hot summer. Mm. Um, that's like July and August, and then it leaves again. Um, but it's really beautiful. And this is a really touristy town. So it gets kind of pretty busy. Um, and we, we spend a lot of time on the beach. Uh, we're really close to Chicago, too. So that's nice. We take a lot of day trips into Chicago and go to a baseball game or museums or Mm. stuff like that so that's awesome yeah well i'll try to sense. i'll try to uh set, send some of our our warmth here from hot Atlanta. see if we can get you <laughs> the longer summer it, it's amazing how hot it gets here sometimes but um we also we get a lot of rain here too like our springs are just like it feels like we're living in a rainforest but okay. anyway well I, I know we're here to hear your story so i'd love to hear kind of um I, I ask people to share as as far back as they can remember um, you know, if you remember, you know, hearing songs in the womb, feel free. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But feel free to take us back as far as you remember. And we'd love to just hear where your, you know, your story started. Um, well, I, I guess my earliest memories in the church are really um, a lot of singing, um, a lot of VBS. And um, what'd you call it? The flannel? flannel. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Those were super early days. Um and I guess I also remember um, a lot of services where, um, I don't know if you ever experienced this, where people come up for prayer and the elders have to come up and stand behind the people coming up for prayer because mm -hmm. you never know who's going to be knocked by the power of the Holy Spirit and they're going to fall back and the elders have to catch. Were you ever around all that? No, that's interesting. So we... Early on, there were there was some Pentecostal um, radical type stuff going on like that, um, but then it seemed like we backed off of that and became more um, seeker friendly, mm. where we really tried to um, downplay that radical stuff, and we just wanted to be a comfortable place for seekers to come and learn more. Did do you remember ever seeing anybody fall backwards? Oh yeah, 
Hmm. Yeah. Was it scary um, as a kid or was that just like, oh, this is God working. This is great. I don't remember. Um, probably both because you just take it as like, um, oh, I guess this is, this is life. This is what happens when you, I, I don't know. It, it was both. It was scary and, oh, okay, this must be real. Yeah. Um, it was just your normal. Yeah. And then, and then later, um, maybe we'll, I mean, I guess we'll get the, to this, but later I started, um, hungering for the Holy Spirit more. And I started questioning, why did we stop praying like that? Why did we stop welcoming the Holy Spirit that way? Um, so that was something I wrestled with. Like I wanted whatever the Holy Spirit had for us. I wanted it. And why weren't we open to that type of prayer anymore, that type of moves of the Holy Spirit anymore? So that was something that I hungered for. And I didn't quite understand why um, some some people experience the Holy Spirit that way. And some people experience the Holy Spirit in different ways. So that yeah. was something I really wrestled with. And I really just wanted to know, how does the Holy Spirit operate? Uh, like, you know, why, why would it vary between personalities or vary between crowds? That was something that I really struggled with. Mm. But, um, were your parents, they were Christians and, and raising you to believe in the Lord. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, may I ask what was that like, a lot of a lot of families would have things like family devotions and you know family prayer time whatever did you all have that kind of home environment and what was it like you know growing up in terms of not the church but just your home life i think we casually read uh kids kids bible stories casually but it, there wasn't ever um a lot of intense talk um, a lot of intense prayer. We prayed before meals. We prayed before bed. Um, and it just seemed like casual Bible stories, but we weren't super intense about it at home. Yeah, that's good. It was like, it was like once you walk into church, then the switch can turn on and we're allowed to be intense and we're allowed to get into the worship or whatever. But at home, it was like, nah, it was just kind of casual or we just didn't do much of it at home. Hmm. So it almost sounds similar to that idea of a, a mountaintop experience. If you remember with that phrase, mm. like, you know, we, I don't, I don't think I, I would have said we, we had it in my world more with church versus home, but it was more just like you would go away to a retreat for two or three days. And, you know, that was meant to be like a mountaintop experience. And it was very hard, of course, or if you went to a missions trip for a week or two, came back where like everything you did for that period of time was just pure worship and sharing the gospel and digging into the word and, you know, just, focused on the Lord in every possible way and confessing your sins. And it felt like weird to come back and be like, okay, so now let's watch some cartoons or football or yeah. like, or, you know, take out the trash. It was like, this is stuff feels so unimportant comparatively. Yes. You know? Yes. Yes. So I went, I would go to um, youth conferences all the time, you know, those big um, stadiums filled with youth and we're rocking out to worship music and they have huge altar calls that thousands of youth are coming and um women's conferences where yeah it felt like a mountaintop experience like okay this is amazing now i've arrived and now i've experienced the holy spirit in a b and c way like this now this is going to set up my life so differently and then you get out of it and you're like man like and, and really, I guess I internalize kind of a failure to like, oh, why can't I keep that up? Why can't I stay in fellowship with the Holy Spirit enough to live life to where I'm always feeling that mountaintop? You know, that that was a sense of frustration and struggle too. It was like, why can't I keep this up? Mm. That's interesting. It's almost like you're like, we're, we're all craving this intensity and maybe arguably it is 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 a even a dopamine thing or whatever that chemical is you know it could be just a chemical rush that we're all seeking but you know in the sense of apart from that side of it just we're seeking these experiences that hone our spiritual um desires and appetites and just get us you know as that song goes turn your eyes upon jesus and the things of this world will, will fade something like that i guess it's a good thing that i'm forgetting i love song. that one you know it's what i'm talking about yes and um <laughs> Oh, yeah, so turn your beautiful. eyes upon Jesus. Yeah. And the things of this world will, will slowly fade or something. But you know, when you when you end up pursuing that more and more and more, you do realize that like you 
you are actively changing your worldview. Like you're 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 making yourself. I mean, I, I don't know what to put, put this this these words in your mouth or anyone else's, but it felt in many ways to me when I would go through what you were talking about that it would end up being like that mountaintop experience that at first seemed like it was hard to reach. It was like, you know, you get it for the weekend when you go away and then you come back to real life. But eventually, as you keep doing it, you you kind of craft your own mentality to the point where you can kind of get a taste of it yourself just by your own quiet mm. time with the Lord. And you're eventually getting yourself to your own personal mountaintop experience in your own mind all the time. At least that was the goal. Did it feel like that at yeah. all for you? Yes. Yeah. I got to the point where um, I was reading the word and feeling like I was getting specific messages, um, reading something about King David taking a census when he wasn't supposed to. And then um, something would, man, it would hit me and I'd go, I know what to do in this situation of my life. Like, you know, taking it and like allegorizing it, if that's the right term, taking it and completely applying it to my life. And it felt who this epiphany would come over me and it, I know what to do now, you know? Um, Did you ever do the I thing even, where you just open up and say, God, just, you know, close your eyes almost and open it up and hopefully that passage is, is the yeah, right one? Yeah. At one point I was struggling, we were struggling with infertility and I was, ah, why is this happening to us, Lord? And I did one of those um, Bible bingo. I open up Psalm 10310, um, for he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities, something like that. And I was like, oh, this infertility is not punishment from him. It was just this, oh, mm. this infertility is not from him. He's not dealing with me according to my sins. And it kind of refreshed me. And um, I, I was left with um, still, how do I understand why I'm going through this infertility? But at least I got that that refreshing of like, well, it's not in response to my past sins. So yeah, things like that, where you could really feel like you're connecting with the word or um, receiving. I mean, I have, I have creepy, creepy, weird experiences too, where um, I knew things that I really shouldn't have known. Um, one time I, I, you know, I was in prayer. Oh, just show me anything. Just tell me anything. I want to be obedient. I want to, do whatever for you. Right. So, um, in my, in my mind's eye, I see very specifically a woman in a certain sun hat and a certain turquoise blouse thing and a certain purse. And I felt like I downloaded, we, we use the term download. If you're familiar, um, sometimes the Holy Spirit will download information to you. And I haven't heard it described I, that way, obviously with the computer context, but that's interesting. Yeah. I, like that. I received a download about um, that she, so God has already forgiven her. She just needs to forgive herself. Okay. That was the message for this woman that I saw. So I was like, whoa, what was that? Was that my imagination? What was that? Um, and like I told you, we're right by the beach. I'm like, I, do I rush down to the beach right now? Or do I just organically, like the next time we're at the beach, do I go look for this woman? Like, how is this supposed to work? Uh, so I just let it be and didn't, I tried to just play it cool. And then a couple days later, we take our son down to the beach and I'm, I'm a nervous wreck, like, oh my gosh, am I going to see this woman that I'm supposed to deliver this message to? And uh, we're there for a couple hours. I don't see her. We're packing up our stuff, getting ready to leave. And guess who's charging down the beach at me? The purse in tow, and she's with the boyfriend or something. And I'm like, no way, no way, no way, no way. Um, I, I chicken out and don't say anything to her. We get all the way back home, but there's something like, like gnawing at me. I'm being disobedient, right? And I can't, I can't just sit in the house and relax while I'm being disobedient. So I'm like, to my husband, sorry, honey, I got to get back over there. So I go have this um, long, intense conversation with her about, hey, I'm trying to listen to the Holy Spirit more and just like 
be open to what he wants me to be doing and um, who he wants me to be talking to. So I think I'm supposed to tell you that he's already forgiven you. You just need to forgive yourself for something. I don't know what that means. I hope you know what that means. And she was, oh my gosh, you know, and she was, I was annoyed because she was um, loving like how it was like this like psychic type of thing, which, which it totally, you know, it kind of was, but I was like, why aren't you falling in love with the Lord right now? <laughs> I was annoyed. Like, don't you want the gospel right now? Don't you want Jesus? But she's just, are you able to see this or see that? Are you able to know this or know that? And I'm like, stop it. It's not about me. It's about the Lord, you know, um, creepy funny. stuff like that, that I, I don't know what to think anymore. You know, um, through my journey, I came to a place where I looked back at that and I, I started like deconstructing it or deciding to reject it as, oh, Satan was at work in me. So I like when I moved into like independent fundamental Baptist, where it's like just the word, just trust the word. You can't trust your own feelings. You can't trust your own whatever. I would look back and go, wow, Satan was working through me. That was really awful. Hmm. So I, uh, it's it was a whirlwind. That's quite an experience. Did you ever feel like you you audibly heard God? No. Okay. No, but plenty of little messages like that um, through the word or seeing things or um, even dumb things like uh, just nature, uh, just, you know, seeing something beautiful and then feeling like I have this epiphany, like, oh, I know what to do dealing mm -hmm. with this relationship or whatever, just, it was all over the place. It's so interesting how that, I think we all did that to different degrees, but it sounds like you definitely had it on a level that was more intense than a lot of us. And it must be so like when you're in it, I would think very fulfilling to feel like God cares enough to direct my particular life. And he's, you know, looking out for me, either he or, you know, the guardian angel, whatever, however he's orchestrating it, but he's doing it in a way to, you know, shelter me from bad stuff and guide me to good stuff. But it's funny when you, when you get into other religions of the world, and especially as you get into more tribal religions, um, are, you, are you familiar with the term animism? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I spent a lot of time um, getting ready to do missions for a group called New Tribes, and they're not called Ethnos 360, but they go into jungle tribal environments where they, the people speak a language but have no alphabet. And they go and they learn the language, they develop an alphabet, and then they translate the Bible into that alphabet for them. And then, of course, teach them the word. Well, one of the things that you do as you're preparing to do this lifestyle of this kind of missions work is you really learn their worldview, which is primarily for most tribal people, it's animism. And animism is this idea that you're not trying to worship any gods. You're just aware that there are spirits in everything. So there's a spirit in that rock, there's a spirit of the stream, there's a spirit of the field. And, and maybe if, if you know, uncle so-and-so was walking through the forest and that particular tree had a branch that fell down and smacked him in the head, there's a spirit in that tree that really doesn't like people or doesn't like you. And so you avoid that. Or maybe the next time uncle so-and-so went by that tree, he said a few magic words and the tree left him alone. So you know that it's okay to go by it if you say these magic words. And you end up with this system where you don't really, you don't really believe in, in the sense of worshiping them. You just want them to either help you or to not hurt you, to ignore you, leave you alone. And it often ends up, I think, translating somewhat into some of the experiences that we had as Christians with the angels and demons world and, and with God, where we're trying to get God to please do good things, you know, help me find that parking spot, help me, my kid to get an A on his test, or for the demons to leave us alone, you know, you know, to stop sending those messages or to just, you know, stop, keep us away from, we used to pray for hedges of protection, to keep us away from the car accidents. And you know, like you like you couldn't you couldn't go on a big trip, a good road trip for four or six hours unless you prayed really intensely first that God would protect your car. Mm -hmm. It ends up being more like a Santa Claus mentality almost, but mixed with animism, where you're like trying to get God to do good things and get the bad things to stay away. And it, it's interesting how that works. There's some of the stuff you said reminds me a little bit of that, and um, it even comes down to simple things like you know, knock on wood, you know, maybe that'll protect me from you know whatever I just the faux pas I just did. But anyway, yeah, I. I did a lot of um, pleading the blood of Jesus over things okay. because with his blood, he has victory over fill in the blank. Hmm. Um, so there was a, there was a stretch there where I was like, why aren't we always doing this? Why aren't we 
pleading the blood over absolutely everything because doesn't that heal and doesn't that solve problems and doesn't that straighten out people's struggles uh, like why aren't we storming you know sick wards with pleading the blood of jesus over you know and then i it, it gets tiresome because you plead the blood of jesus over a situation and it doesn't iron out so mm. yeah then you then you get out of that habit but would they have done that would you have done that in the in the context of even like really small things like god i can't find my keys i plead the blood where's my keys is it was or was it more just like serious stuff like someone's in the hospital i think i i tried to stay away from little things like using it for little things like that um i tried to only use it for big serious things mm. yeah i think we did something similar but it was more um, just like you, the name, like I, I have to pray in Jesus' name. Um, as long as you say it, you know, I pray this in Jesus' name. Uh, I don't think we did the blood as much, but I know what you mean. It's interesting. It, and it, you end up realizing in some ways that you're you're developing a magic mentality. Like these these magic words protect you. And if you don't say it, you know, the bad things can happen. Oh, you know, you, you didn't say it. So that's why the bad thing happened. And it's like, that's that's animism. That's, that's, that's pure animism. But when you're in the middle of it, it's not magical thinking to you. It's just right. truth. It's just what he's given us and yeah. that's great mm. so and were your parents just for context were your parents the same way where they were doing the same thing um my mom was a little more um pentecostal thinking um my dad was uh is kind of more um I, I don't know what to straight lace like let's not talk about specifics that's another aspect of how i grew up was like let's not talk about specific doctrines let's not talk about specific anything there's the there's the center of the bullseye which is jesus died and rose for us <clears throat> and anything outside of that like oh should we pray this way or should we pray that way or does the holy spirit operate this way or that way those are outer rings of the bullseye and they can cause division and why spend time arguing why spend time wondering about that stuff mm. so um that's a lot of how my parents operate and my my christian crowd operated was kind of like um let's let's stay away from speaking too specifically about anything because let's all just be brothers and sisters in christ and mm. i guess it keeps you away from a lot of the arguments that can get the petty arguments that can come up with uh theology discussions, especially like, you know, revelation, you know, what happens in the end times. You know, well, you know, if, if, if we're all saying we're disagreeing with it, like, let's just calm it down and focus on the big, you know, on the majors, which is of course the gospel. Hmm. Yeah. And then, and part of my, part of my journey was um, growing up. And like I said, like, shouldn't I be able to nail down a little bit whether the Holy Spirit is going to work this way or whether he wants to work that way? Like, and, you know, is this doctrine true or is it false? You know, I, so as I started coming into like young adulthood and my own, like trying to exercise my own Christianity, I got a little frustrated with the, like, let's not talk about stuff. No, I want to talk about stuff and I want to nail down what this is supposed to look like because I want to be obedient. I want to be spreading truth and not spreading lies. Like, so I went into very black and white thinking, like, why aren't we talking about what's right and what's wrong and mm. all of that? I, I got frustrated with that. Yeah, it's, it's, I was the same way. It's, I, I can definitely resonate. It's, it's funny, too, how so, so many people, I know you didn't, I don't think you said that you went down this route, but for so many people, that route takes them to Calvinism. It's really weird. But when you, can I ask, when you were in this church, was there a particular time when you were a kid or you know young teenager when you just absolutely heard a clear gospel message and believed or like what was it like to to not just grow up in it but was there a time when you said this is actually my official decision i'm going to follow christ uh my grandma and my mom sat me down at 4 years old and had the little preschool version and i remember doing that praying something with them and then growing up, I I think I was always responding to the all. We didn't really do altar calls in my church. It was it was um, we wanted to keep people comfortable in their seats and not have to come up front. So it was like um, 
And we're all going to say this prayer in unison and God knows who's saying it for the first time and who is really meaning it for the first time. So every time that was done, I was doing like growing up, I was doing it and I was thinking maybe this is going to be the one that like, I have to keep putting my heart into this just in case, um, this is a true commitment, you know, and I'm really gonna, I'm really gonna make it happen this time. Hmm. Um, so that was a little bit torturous <laughs> growing did, up. Did you feel secure though, in the sense that you, you felt like it's at a certain point, you weren't in danger of eternal damnation that you were like, I'm, I'm secure in Christ now. I'm, I know I definitely have a savior. <clears throat> I always felt like that until the next one where I could question myself. I, mm. I really had faith. Like, I think I had this, um, overriding trust in him where it was like, he sees that I tried, I've, I've tried to make the commitment. So I, I guess I just have to trust him with my salvation. So I wasn't really tortured with the thoughts of like, maybe it didn't work, but when the opportunity presented itself again in a new service and a new message and the new prayer, then I would just like hop on board just in case because I wanted to make sure. I don't know. But I wasn't tortured with fears of hell or anything. Mm. Um, I I just trusted him that he saw that I was trying to be committed and mm -hmm. whatever. I, I got to a point in 2020 um, where I heard, are you familiar with like Paul Washer? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Ray Comfort? Yeah. So I found them in 2020 fell down YouTube rabbit holes of finding their versions of really like, uh, like, cause be, because before growing up, the gospel was, um, feel good. It's like, oh, we're imperfect and we make mistakes and Jesus kind of brushes over all that for us. But Ray Comfort and Paul Washer, gouge you in the heart, you know, and say, you are really actually this bad and you are horrible. And I, so when I found Paul Washer and his shocking youth message, I think that's what it is, like his shocking message to a youth conference or something, I listened and I was, <gasps> my, I was sick to my stomach. He hit me. And I, and when I listened to that, I'm like, I have never been saved in all my life, but now I am hearing mm -hmm. this one. So it, it was, it's just kind of torturous. Like you can hear it in a different way and then, oh, okay, I have to jump on this train, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So Paul Washer was majorly pivotal and took me out of my, my past Christianity. And I went into um, more literal, I guess, more fundamentalist thinking. I don't know. That's, ama that's an amazing experience. I mean, obviously we're going to go into the rest of the story, but just that part of it alone is so crazy. And I, I, I had a similar experience with, uh, are you familiar with John MacArthur? Yeah. And um, he, he had a, a guy that was, I think one of his staff at some point, he was a musician named Steve Camp. Does that ring a bell? Mm -mm. Um, he, he would, he did songs where he basically focused a lot on the idea of you're not really a Christian if you're in any way ashamed of Christ. So like when I was growing up, what, they would have these prayers for people to, to pray to believe in Jesus, but they would say, everybody, you know, close your eyes, bow your heads. If you want to trust Christ and you want an you know, elder to come pray with you, raise your hand, but no one's looking at you. And and Steve Camp, this musician, I remember going to a con concert of his, and he would do the opposite, say, with everybody watching, with every eye on you, stand up if you want Christ to be your savior. It's like, because if you don't, if you're not willing to be public about it, then you don't you don't really want Christ. You want like your little personal little version of it. It's like Christ wants you to be willing to count the cost and give up mother, father, brothers, sisters, mm -hmm. everything for him. And he would sing these songs about you know we can't be living in Laodicea and just just being on fire and and like if you're not burning with passion for the lost and to love and know God, you're not a Christian. Like true Christians know that their God is the most important thing in the world. And the next most important thing in the world besides knowing and loving him is sharing him with other people. If you're focused on other stuff, you're really in a dangerous spot. And that sounds very similar to your experience with Paul Washer. And it it does. Once you realize it, you're like, I'm on. Yeah, I want I want that train. That's the train. That's the ticket I want. And it's yeah. you feel alive. Yeah, I I didn't feel saved until then. 
Um, mm-hmm. And I, uh, I feel bad doing this interview at all because I feel like if my family were to stumble upon it, it would be like this major betrayal or something that I'm even <laughs> talking about all this. I, I hope they can, I don't know. I hope they can hear my heart that people can hear my heart. Like I don't, I don't blame my family for anything. They, their version of Christianity is like, yes, let's love Jesus, but let's also be real and live in the real world and keep our head on straight and not get too far in the weeds with this doctrine, not get too far in the weeds with this doctrine. It's just Christ. And then you continue on like a normal person in life. But, um, but I got fed up with that. I, something, yeah, I, I needed to be devoted. Like if this is actually like black and white true, then I, I don't see how I can be a, a regular person in the regular world. I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand it. I, we have to go far off in the weeds and be ready to abandon everything else for him. So I, mm-hmm. I took that on and left my family behind where they, I know they kind of, I feel like they kind of saw me like, Hey, how do we, how do we rein her back in? <laughs> but mm-hmm. I was gone. I, I was devoted and I didn't know how not to be. Yeah. It w- I think that once you get a few certain messages, like I remember messages, like if the demons aren't seeing you as a threat, you're doing it wrong. Like you need oh, to be yeah. so intense about your love, passion for the Lord and for the gospel that, that the demons, the demons see you and you're now on the radar. They want to take you down. Like if you're like, if you're not a threat to them, then like, what are you doing? Like your life is a waste. And yeah. I, what's that? Oh, sorry. No, please. God. What's that saying? Um, uh, I, I want to be the type of believer. I'm going to butcher it, but it's like, I want to be the type of believer when, you know, my feet hit the floor in the morning, Satan says, oh crap, she's up again or something <laughs> like that. Like, yeah, that yeah. was, that was me. Hmm. And I think too, when you mix it in with, with spiritual warfare, which I did want to ask you about next, you realize in a sense, you have to be that intense because there, you know, it's described in Ephesians as a, as a battle and you have to have armor on you know, you're fighting a battle. You're not here to just be a casual Christian. You are actually in a war. Um, mm-hmm. Did you feel like that was true of you, that you were in a spiritual battle and that you were kind of equipping yourself to fight? I I think I tried mostly to stay away from that and just focus on God. I okay. did have certain seasons where I would let myself ponder, like, are there demons around the corner giving my kid bad dreams, you know, or like, I'd kind of ponder it, but um, I couldn't focus ever too much on it. I just tried to stay focused on him and allow him to iron out the angels and demons stuff. I, even in my belief, I I felt like that's that feels kind of like um, witchcrafty type. Like maybe I shouldn't be trying to reach into these realms and like affecting it. Yeah. But so I, I went through seasons where I, I did kind of experiment with it. Um, I'm just remembering my son would have, um, he was like three, and he'd kind of be creeped out about, you know, looking around the corner into like a shadowy room. And he, uh, it tortures me now. He would say, I think I saw something in that room. And my husband would try saying, no, you didn't. It's just your imagination. I would correct my husband and say, um, honey, you don't, you don't actually know if there could be something there. Like we, instead of telling him, instead of denying what he just experienced, we need to be open to the possibility that he is seeing something and he needs to learn how to be equipped and like, get away from me in Jesus name. So Mm -hmm. I, I did go through that with my kids sometimes where it was like, you guys need to be ready. You have the power of Jesus where you can say, get, we make it a little, a little silly, funny thing. Get out of my house in Jesus name with the sass. And they loved it. Um, but now it, it tortures me because I'm like, that's just kind of magical thinking that, but it was real. So, and I thought I was equipping my kids, you know, so it's, mm. it's hard. Yeah. I, I definitely want to, I know it's jumping ahead, but I want to get to, to hear more about the, the kids part of this. Cause I know it's a big, big issue is, is you know, how we, uh, both raise kids before as Christians and then how that changes with deconversion. But um, so when you're, when you're in your, you know, teenage years growing up, what was your expectation for like, did you feel like God was guiding you to a certain future, whether it was to be a housewife or a missionary? Like, what did you feel like God was saying 
I'm, I'm, I've got a path for you and this is it? Or did you feel like that was vague? It felt vague. Okay. It, it always it felt like I was flying by the seat of my pants, really. Or I guess that's how I look back and describe it now. I was flying by the seat of my pants. Okay. Just um, little decisions like, oh, he, you know, this job opportunity is available. Maybe that's from him. You know, just like little pivots in my journey. I never had any big vision um, for my for my future. I I did feel like college. I don't even like I said. I don't even come from fundamentalist crowds where where they really tell the wife to stay home and take care of the kids. That that's not my crowd. My crowd is like like I said, be normal. Go work. Go do whatever you want. Like whatever whatever you want, as long as Jesus is the center of your life. So, Mm. um, but in me, just privately in me, I was a little tortured by why should I waste time going to college? Uh, Isn't, isn't that a waste? Like, shouldn't I be available in the future for kids um, to be raising them? So I put that pressure on myself to kind of question why should I care about college and why should I care about a career? So I would waffle, I would take on a good job and then I'd kind of back off of it a little bit and question, and, oh, this new job is opening up. Maybe this will um, be more flexible for a future with kids someday. Just, I just flying by the seat of my pants, just always questioning and always in doubt of what was really the, the way to go. It's mm. interesting with the, Go back to your story with Paul Washer and, and those guys. How did your theology change as you became more exposed besides just the, obviously the worm theology, you're very wicked, but were there other changes in your theology that were happening? And, and of course, you know, but what was, what were the next steps? Cause I know you said you eventually didn't even stay there. You landed in Hebrew roots, right? Yeah. Like how did that, how did that whole period of time and, and how long was that? Was that just a year or two? So Paul Washer, um, that was exactly a year where I, I got saved by Paul Washer <laughs> and, uh, that was, that was probably about 11, 12 months where I was, I was still trying to stay at my church, but, um, it was a ever increasing frustration with like, wait, should we really be explaining the gospel that way? Or should we explain it this way? You know, or just a frustration of like, well, we're putting on this event at the church. Isn't anyone going to deliver the gospel afterwards? Or, you know, just so I was, I was, it was a struggle of um, my changing um, perspective, trying to stay in my church. And I'm trying to think, um, surely my, my doctrines and my theologies like privately were kind of shifting and I was questioning things, um, but I can't think of specifics. I guess I, like I said, I looked back on my Holy Spirit experiences and I thought, whoa, that's satanic. Um, One thing I ran into um, right when I was, um, my life was wrecked with Paul Washer and Ray Comfort. I also found people um, sharing videos of, you know, the big mega churches. Um, These were like video clips from the 90s where um, whole crowds, you know, whole crowds in a church. A, a pastor waves his holy, you know, hand and a whole section of people collapse back in their pews. Mm. And so I'm watching these video clips and it was amazing. The comment section, because one comment would be like, Oh, that was such a powerful move of the Holy spirit. I miss services like this. And the next comment would be, this is so satanic. This is not the Holy spirit at work. And so that started unraveling my Holy Spirit thoughts, like my thoughts about the Holy Spirit. I'm reading the comments and I, I remember being like pulled apart, like who's right and who's wrong. Oh my. And, and you look at Mm. those services, they're, they're ridiculous now, you know, um, people falling and laughing uncontrollably and all my life, it was like, okay, that's fine for some people to do, but we don't really do that. We don't, but we don't debate people on how they experience God, right? You just, you just don't go there. Okay. We understand that stuff happens, but we don't go there. But I got to this point where I'm like, no, 
I, I need to go there. Like I need to understand, is that the Holy Spirit or is it not? And so I, uh, I found people in the comments saying, um, no, that's uh, Kundalini. Is that how you say it? Are you familiar with that? I don't think so. Say it again. Kundalini spirit. I don't think I've heard that now. I think that's how you say it. But um, so I would find, then I found people taking those church services and taking like a, what do I want to say? Um, Hindu maybe, or some other, you know, Eastern religion or whatever, and showing them side by side. And people are doing the exact same thing. Mm. You know, the laughter on the falling on the floor, laughter falling on the floor, shrieking and yelling, shrieking and yelling. So I, my, I was, I was wrecked. I'm like, what, what do we do about this? So that reinforced my, my position, my direction to go towards independent fundamental Baptist, where it's like, you don't trust your emotions. You don't trust anything. It's about the word, dig into the word and that's it. Um, mm. the rapture was still there. I, I dealt with fears of the rapture all growing up and then independent fundamental Baptists, the rapture, they still t teach the, um, pre pre trib rapture. Mm. Um, for anyone that doesn't know what the word rapture means, could you just define what it meant to you? So the rapture is when, um, Jesus decides to finally come back for his church and, um, we were basically going to disappear into the sky and um according to the left behind movies we were going to leave our clothes behind leave our wedding rings behind leave everything behind and we were just going to be gone we were just going to be piles of clothes that people find later and that would trigger the beginning of the seven year tribulation mm. um i remember i was going to mention this i remember waking up from naps as a small kid and it's a pretty spring or summer day uh, I can't find anyone in the house. Um, turns out everybody was outside, you know, gardening or like playing on their bikes or something. But I wake up from a nap and I'm like, and several times, it was several times. Oh, okay. The rapture happened and I'm here left behind to fend for myself or die in the seven year tribulation. Mm. So I remember so, that. So you understood that, that, uh, eschatology, even as a kid, that's crazy. Yeah. Was that, was that a, a fearful thing or did you, did you still feel like, okay, well, I guess God will take care of me through this or, you know, how was that emotionally uh, a reaction? Um, I was so little. I, I would just, it would, it was probably just, you know, 30, 60 seconds. <laughs> like, yeah. oh no, I'm left behind. And then I see my sister outside or something. Hmm. But um, as I got a little older, again, I would just resort to, no, I trust him. I trust him. Yeah. So, I trust that I'll be raptured. Um, and if we're somehow wrong about pre-trib rapture, and if it's post-trib rapture, then okay, I'm going to be ready to die for him or trust him to get me through or whatever. I just always resorted to trusting him. And mm. I know Paul Washer um, and people like him have a very high view of scripture. Did you feel like you kind of either already had that or, or it's for sure that you, you honed that mentality when you were in the Baptist uh, groups where like this idea of every word of God is, is pure. It's, 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 it's obviously without error and it, you know, it's meant to be taken literally, you know, for the most part, did you feel like that was yeah. where you were growing up or that you landed that, that way? And how did that affect you to see the spirit of God, you know, however you saw it? It's hard to wrap my head around it now, but um, I, vaguely growing up, it was, it was the word of God. It was perfect. Uh, but we didn't talk, we didn't talk specifics about anything. Um, mm. so yeah, so Paul Washer and that, those crowds kind of spoke to my frustration that I had had, my building frustration where like, I should be able to pinpoint how the Holy Spirit works and how he doesn't work, you know, how we should understand this scripture, you know, do we understand it this way or that way? So I, I did, um, I love, I loved finding them because it was okay let's let's really get serious with this and let's really you know and i'd look at um i started wondering why are women in ministry when paul said he doesn't permit women to uh, have authority over a man um mm -hmm. and why don't we wear head coverings where like all my life it was like I don't know. I just, I trusted that 
there must be very good reasons why we're not doing this and we're not doing that. So blah, blah, blah. You just move on. But in my adulthood, trying to live it out for myself, I wanted the answers myself. And um, so, yeah, I started pondering those things. I never really pulled the trigger on um, wearing a head covering or... (laughs) anything like that, but it it was more sources of frustration where I'm like, why can Paul say these things? And we blatantly just don't, don't apply it. Well, then you have all the apologetics about, well, Paul said he didn't permit women to teach over men because in that specific church, in that specific town, in that specific time, there was a group of women that was wreaking havoc and like, so you get overwhelmed with apologetics. Like, why can't it, why can't the word just be the word for me? Why is it for me, but it's not for me? You know, it's very yeah. frustrating. I always thought too. It's it's an interesting question that came up with with my life a couple of times. Of is the word of God clear enough for the most basic, simple person? You know, pick somebody that never went to Bible college, never went to seminary doesn't understand a bunch of theological terms, can they just get the plain sense of most scripture? Or do you need to really understand the Hebrew and the Greek and the ancient context and go into all these details? And I would want to land on the idea of, of this is simple, you know, little old grandma that never went to Bible college, she just she just listens to Chuck Swindoll and she just loves the Lord and, you know, loves her word and loves the church. And she just wants to keep it simple and she can open the word and understand it. It's that simple. And then a pastor like Paul Washer or John MacArthur or someone like that would open up and bring an insight that would completely change the meaning. And I was like, so grandma does need to know more about the Greek and the Hebrew and Aramaic, and she needs to know these other things yeah. or else she, she could be completely off base with her interpretation. And it frustrated me a lot that you can't just pick it up. And it it does, it keeps on, it's a moving target. And like, I know your story is a good example of this and we'll get into it in a second with the Hebrew roots, but like people keep on, people keep on shifting. Start to, people keep on shifting in so many ways. Um, In Bible college, I saw it, it's post Bible college, people keep on going in different places. And like you said, they feel like they finally arrived when they get to a certain camp. And then two, three, four years later, they're in a different camp and, oh, I've got a better version of it. And it's like, this doesn't sound like God is the the Bible says God is not the author of confusion, but it sounds like it's very confusing. And I remember very much like the last few days or weeks before my deconversion, one of the biggest thoughts that hit me over and over was if this is from this book, if this is from a God, this is a really crappy product. Like it's not like this is, doesn't feel divine anymore. And I know that that was, you know, toward the very end of my process, I wouldn't have said that earlier, but it just felt like it's so heretical, so, Tim. Yeah. There, but there's just, <laughs> there's so many ways in which you think like if, are you familiar with Matt Dillahunty? Yeah. Like he, he, one of the things and he, he's, you know, he's got so many great insights, but one of the insights that I think um, a lot of us have heard him talk about a lot is the idea of slavery and how, if you can just say, if you were just put, put one verse in the Bible, Hey, don't own slaves ever, period. Just don't own them. You, you were instantly better than God. You've made the Bible better. You've made God better. But since God didn't say it, you're better than God. But that and things like it would keep hitting and it'd be like, wait a second, like this book doesn't sound like a God. And somebody else, I forget who brought up the idea of back in the in that era, people could die of the most basic infections. Like anything could kill you. You, you know, you, your tooth could get a cavity or something. It turns into an infection. Bam, your tooth kills you all kinds of things, you know, you cut yourself, you're dead in a few days. Wouldn't it be amazing if God could like show up big and say, hey, to you ancient Near Eastern people, you know, here's an an recipe for an antibiotic, (laughs) like show up big and change the world with your message. But instead, neither he nor Jesus ever comes up with anything that's just like, I'm going to radically transform your world in the most beautiful but simple way possible. He just doesn't do the most basic things that you think if this is divine, he could have and arguably should have done this and that and this and that, but he doesn't. And it, I'm just 
it's hitting the top tip of the iceberg there, but it felt so much like as I as I was deconverting, it felt like the message was coming through loud and clear. Is this the best we've got? Like, and, and you you realize as, as you mentioned apologetics, like you're on the side of trying to and needing to defend it. And if you're like, if I'm going to defend this book, I want to actually feel like I can and want to defend it. And when it falls apart enough where you're like, okay, I don't feel comfortable defending this stuff. That's a really uncomfortable spot to be. I don't know, I'm jumping ahead here, but that's that's the kind of stuff that that stuff reminds me of. It, it It's a very weird place to be. I, you know, and I'm ashamed to say, I I never got to that critical thinking place until afterwards. I, I wasn't, uh, do I want to say I wasn't smart enough? So I was so surrendered that, I can be frustrated with the apologetics, but this this will always be true. That was where I was always at, was this will always be true. I may fail to find what exactly is the right answer, but this will always be true. I never, ever could wrap my head around this actually falling apart and this actually just being written by a bunch of ancient dudes. It, it, that never dawned on me. So I'll, I'll have, I'll get to how it really fell apart for me because my critical thinking did not do it for me. Mm. There was no critical thinking because I was, I was hell bent on, I will be obedient and I will be trying to find the right answer and how I should be understanding A, B, and C. I, I will always be seeking out to mm. find understanding. I think there's even a verse that you're reminding of this says something like, let God be true and every man a liar. Yep. And it's like, you know, at the end of the day, you know, God is God, he's the king and he's the truth. And, you know, you you will bow your knee one way or the other to his reality and to his message, to his authority. And yeah, it, I completely resonate with that. It, it, it it's, it's amazing the cognitive dissonance, how it kicks in so much. Yeah. So what, what took you from that version of Christianity to Hebrew roots? Because that's, that's a pretty big jump in some ways. So uh, I have a friend that, oh my gosh, all our friendship, I was trying to get her saved. Um, she was the atheist friend that I was like, why don't you just believe he loves you so much, you know? Um, but she always put up with me, <laughs> had patience with me. And so um, around 2020 and 2021, we were always talking about, oh, look at COVID, end time stuff. Look at this and look at that. Um prophecies being fulfilled, you know, whatever types of stuff that I would try talking to her about. And I was getting her attention. She was circling around to belief. And she found um, Christian Torah observance or Hebrew roots or whatever. She found some stuff about that. And she's like, have you ever listen to this stuff like have you ever entertained these like considered this stuff and at first i was oh stay away from it they want you to work for your salvation you know we know the right answers to that like no we don't work for our salvation jesus did it all and we're set free from those laws and she's like hold on just just will you just check this out just do me a favor and check this out and so you know, you sit and listen. I, I've decided that you sit and listen to any anything for a certain amount of time, and you can start wrapping your head around how somebody can make sense this way. You know, you you just you can just wrap your head around it eventually with enough um, compassion and listening. So they have a way of explaining that no, we're not working for our salvation. Um, this is Jesus earned us our salvation, but the Torah and commandments and various things laid out in that is the lifestyle that God wanted for his people. And um, so whether they come out and, because of course there's different Hebrew roots camps, like different versions, but so whether they come out and say it or not, the thinking, at least my thinking was kind of like, um, it started out as a physical Israel and now we're a spiritual Israel, or maybe physical Israel. We thought it was a physical people, but really it was going to be a spiritual people. And now we're part of his spiritual family. And if we care about um, how he wants his family to operate, we should be on board. And there's um, 
there's scripture about um it's it's not a burden it's not it's not a heavy burden it is easy and light um the old testament says that somewhere and jesus says that um so we use that like no it's not too hard and he's there he's there to forgive you when you're not gonna keep this commandment or do things perfectly but the whole thing is trying to live that way and that sets you up um to live a lifestyle that he laid out for his people um i would use the the example of you know if you adopt like imagine adopting an older teenager and um so they become a part of your family what if that teenager just sits in their room pouting and uh, i don't care how you guys celebrate certain holidays i don't care what you guys think is good for me to eat and what's not good for me to eat i don't care i'm not listening so were they adopted were they saved yes but why don't we join the family on how things are supposed to be celebrated certain things are supposed to be celebrated and certain things are not supposed to be celebrated certain things are supposed to be eaten and certain things are not supposed to be eaten all that stuff like let's care about the family that we've joined and care about how they want to function but you weren't just doing the, the big like the ten commandments you were doing like some of the smaller laws like it wasn't just yeah. like don't covet your neighbor's stuff and don't have a commit adultery or something you were doing like like sabbath kind of stuff Was that... yes okay um i observe sabbath with my kids okay. um my husband never got around to it my husband has to work saturdays and um i I tried not to bug him about it. I just had faith, like, if this is the truth, then he's eventually going to see it or whatever. And mm -hmm. he's going to make moves to get out of this job or whatever. So I really didn't put pressure on my husband, but me and my kids, I would lovingly explain, like, we want to please God and he doesn't want us buying and selling on the, on the Sabbath, which is Saturday. And we don't want to make anyone else work. So we don't go to events where people are working to work the work the function, work the event. We don't go to that because people are working for us on Saturday and we don't do that. So mm -hmm. we're going to find fun things to do around here. We can go places and hang out where people are not working, where we're not spending money. Um, but and they were completely my kids were completely on board because we wanted to be pleasing to the Lord. But you still um, went to church on Sundays? Okay. Did you change your clothing or your food diet at all? Uh, we we stayed away from pork. Okay. All pork. You gave up bacon? Oh. <laughs> yes, we went to turkey bacon, mm. which it was horrible at first, but then we all kind of started liking it. Yeah. Um, turkey bacon does not make as much of a mess at all. Mm. The pork bacon sprays everywhere, and turkey bacon does not spray anything. Mm. Did you have to wear a head covering? in that group um uh well i never joined an actual group i just okay. kind of joined this friend and a couple of our other friends where we were just like checking this out we were just listening to teachers online and stuff um i never got super into it where i was going into head coverings and different stuff but i was and i always had faith like all right you see me trying god you see me you have patience with me. I'm trying to wrap my head around feasts. I'm trying to wrap my head around the dietary stuff. So um, I did never put pressure on myself to really um, make huge changes. I was I just trusted myself to kind of warm into different moves I needed to make to be more obedient slowly. Mm. It's amazing. I, I again confess my ignorance of some of the Hebrew roots movements, but I've been exposed enough. Just I, I got into a lot of it. Um, a lot of the groups where because of some research I've been doing for the book of Enoch, which is a really big uh, part of my story, but a lot of them go back to this idea of the the different festivals and the new moons. And mm -hmm. I, I, even this past week, I was listening to, to one of them on YouTube where they're just like, they're so big into when is the new moon and what does that mean and what month are we in in terms of the Hebrew calendar and what does this mean for the festival? And like they really get tuned into the phases of the moon like crazy yeah. like the phase of the moon means the world to them and you have to know exactly where you are to know which celebration you're in and it's 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 crazy the the way that that worldview shifts but 
like they feel like they're not being righteous at least from the groups that i've seen they're not being righteous unless they understand when to do the festivals when you know where is the moon in its phases and that becomes like righteousness to them like if you can get that knowledge and actually live it out you're a righteous person i'm like it's it's such a different perspective from where i grew up and i'm not like condemning it per se i'm just it's just so radically different because for us righteousness was like go feed the poor go you know go help somebody you need to them a lot of them it's like figure out what phase the moon is in and then that tells you which festival you are in and when you you know when you have to when when the sabbath is officially and all these nuances and the specific months in hebrew and a lot of them end up taking on a lot of hebrew verbiage as well i've noticed a lot of them end up using hebrew like so much in their daily lives going forward because they feel like it's somehow connecting like you said to the family of origin to to ancient israel and it this shift though i think it also ends up just like a lot of other christian groups we all get into and, or go through it makes you feel very proud like you're like okay i finally arrived i got it like i got it god is the god of israel you know he is he is israel's god he's not you know the church is god first he's israel's god and so you arrived at this wonderful pinnacle spot of finally your theology came to the right spot and god you know mm-hmm. you feel like god's guiding you here he's been mm-hmm. guiding you to the right truth and i was telling somebody else in a re- recent interview that it often feels to me like even generationally that the way i was thinking as a, as a young adult that previous generations were making mistakes that god was correcting in my generation so for example mm-hmm. my grandfather and grandmother at least my dad's side they were lutherans they're very cold it was you know they went to church so it was a lady pastor which in my group you know circles was a big no-no it was very cold you know you come you kind of do your thing you say a few hymns you you know you take the wafer and you go and you've done your thing that's being a christian you went to church on sunday it doesn't really affect your life almost at all and then my mom's generation they were all like really strong into this conservative baptist church so like they kind of got the message and got it a little bit tighter and then in my generation we were getting into calvinism it's like we got it really tight like we're really mm-hmm. honing the message and i'm sure hebrew roots feels like the same like but they you know a different path but like we're getting the message tighter and tighter we're getting back to what the original people heard from god and what god meant and we're taking away these hundreds of years of distortion that the church and culture has put on it and if you, it's almost like if you can get back to that spot there's a clear channel for god to speak to you does that does that resonate with you at all yes yeah um 2020 i went through a bunch of checking out a bunch of conspiracy theories okay and so going through this faith journey it was like the ultimate i had i had discovered the ultimate conspiracy theories that the church the modern church was completely had completely been led into lawlessness and um uh, we had totally been robbed of the lifestyle that we were supposed to be living. And Satan is really running the modern church. I mean, like crazy stuff like that. It, it, it struck the conspiracy theory chord with me. It was like, yes, like this is the ultimate conspiracy theory. And I'm going to write it in my life. I'm going to write it. I'm going to live the lifestyle that um, everyone has abandoned and we shouldn't have abandoned. <clears throat> with all those changes, you mentioned your husband for a bit. Were you all able to at least, I mean, even if you couldn't do stuff on Saturdays, but were you able to talk through it? And did you feel like there was a camaraderie of, of just the investigation process of saying, there's more information here that we weren't told, we need to know more about, you know, how to really honor God? Was he on board with that? Or, or were you all kind of in different camps for a while? Um, he's so easygoing. And there there's something about him that just isn't tortured with um, what is ultimate truth? I've heard you and a couple other of your guests like, ah, I just have to know what ultimate truth is. And I don't get how, you know, these other people aren't tortured with it. Well, my husband is just, I don't know. He's just kind of along for the ride. He he grew up Lutheran and mm-hmm. he's always just been cool with the casual belief. And um, And we're done on Sunday afternoon type of thing. So I was tortured with, like, I, I presented the Paul Washer sermon to him. And at first he was like, oh, that sounds awful. And then I'd kind of talk, I kinda talked him into it. Like, no, but you don't understand if we've been thinking the gospel 
thinking of the gospel this way instead of that way. So I would always be the one trying to, don't you get it? And then with Torah, I was like, don't you get it? And he he would listen very patiently, um, but we never really, he's not tortured with um, figuring any of that out. And I never understood it. I'm like, mm-hmm. if there's if there's a God in charge and he wants things a certain way, how does that not bug you? How do you not want to figure it out? And he's like, I don't know. I just I just have faith that he'll save me and that's it. I just want to live life kind of thing. Mm. Not not meaning to put words in his mouth, but that's always what I got from him was like, let's just have faith that he'll save us and we go on. Yeah. But that it's never been I've never been good with that. I need I need specifics and I need what is ultimately true and what is ultimately false. So he was always just really patient and understanding and I could I could talk enough to where he's like I get where you're going, I get where you're coming from and where you're going. I get it. Um and he would he would refrain from the pork along with me and my kids, but um he didn't actually care. Yeah. Um, so he was supportive of your journey though. Yes. He just so patient and just letting me just go down my rabbit trails and work things out. Um, when everything fell apart for me, he was so, um, relieved. (laughs) What fell apart in terms of just leaving Christianity altogether. My faith. Yeah. Because because that's kind of shocking though. Cause isn't that still, like a core value of his yeah so he was but, just letting you do your thing yeah i you know because i it was the last my last stop was Torah observance and that was sabbath and worrying about holidays and blah 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 so when i sat him down and i was like man i i just don't think i believe anymore it was kind of this like tangible like okay <laughs> We can get off the roller coaster ride. Kelsey's wanna, roller coaster. I want to step back a minute uh, to go through some details of what what happened there at the end. But just since you're on this topic, did that not threaten him? The sense of like like what are you saying that you're an agnostic or an atheist or that there's like this none of this is true? Like did he not feel somewhat like you were attacking his worldview or at least trying to effectively passively invalidate it? No. Really. He doesn't care and and it's a it's it's a new me like i am a new free person um anxieties are like gone they're unraveling and they're vanishing and i am a fresh fun person and he sees this change so he doesn't care that's That's crazy it's funny he reminds me of (laughs) the way he described his personality i remember in bible college one of the big discussions of course was always, you know, what is the, what is the right interpretation of the end times? Meaning, are you pre-mill, post-mill, amill? I remember this one teacher, he said, yeah, I, I go back and forth and I'll read this person and I'm pre-mill. I read this person, I'm on post-mill. And he said, you know what? I've landed on, on pan-mill. I said, pan-mill, what's that? He said, it'll all pan out in the end. <laughs> Good answer. It sounds like yeah. your husband would have agreed with that. Like, yeah, we, we don't need to argue. It'll, it'll work out. Pretty much. Well, with with your story though, at the end, um, even you know Hebrew roots certainly seems like an easier step toward atheism or agnosticism from my perspective than, than hardcore Christianity. But like, how did you actually get to that point? Because you're still even with Hebrew observance, you're still very much believing Jesus is your savior, and you, yeah. you have have to deal with that this sin issue. How did you move past that? Well, um, there was a lot of I had to. I was trying to figure out uh, the Trinity. The Trinity was up for debate then in Hebrew roots um, and different camps have the different things to say about the Trinity. And it all sounds so heretical, Um, but I was trying to wrap my head around. So what do they have to say about the Trinity? What do they have to say about the Trinity? I also started struggling with now, wait, how exactly does a human sacrifice satisfy because when you get into hebrew roots and really caring about what the torah says like i felt like okay i really need to see how god prescribed jesus 
and then how Jesus steps in and fulfills. It's like it's like the doctor needed to prescribe the certain thing and Jesus needed to be that thing. Like I need to see it in the Torah. So I started struggling with where exactly does a human sacrifice satisfy something in the Torah? Um, and you'll find different camps in Hebrew roots that say, um, don't overthink it. It satisfies our punishment. Like, don't overthink it. And then there's this other oh, crazy um, camp that says, so his, see if you can wrap your head around this, his death itself doesn't actually achieve anything. It's that he had to die in order to graduate to heaven. And now in heaven, he is actively sacrificing animals as a, as a priest on our behalf. Wow. Like that's how he saves us. So I, I listened to that and I'm like, Whoa, like I can't go there. That is completely betraying everything I ever thought I knew about Jesus. Like, how do you make that jump? That yeah. was mind blowing. I believe the technical um, term for that is cuckoo bananas. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever hear though the, the similar version um, of that in, in some Baptist groups? You know that song, there was a fountain filled with blood, something like that up in heaven. But some of them would preach that that's not like a, a, an allegorical song. Like there's actually a fountain in heaven. And I don't know if they would have said that like God is actually like dipping souls in the blood ah. or, or what, but like, like there's a fountain filled with Jesus's blood and that's what saves you. Like his, his blood truly saves you not in the sense of you just remember that he died for you but like his actual chemical blood like there's something different i remember people used to try to prove like jesus's blood was chromosomally different because of because of not having a human father mm -hmm. his blood had to be different and therefore it was very different and that's what saves us is his magic blood and it's it's just mm -hmm. crazy well yeah so um uh well, then in the Hebrew roots, you run into people who are, well, some people are looking at all that Paul says and trying to explain, trying to save Paul. No, 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 no. In context, Paul is trying to address this and this, this and that. He's not actually telling us to, that we don't have to care about the law. Paul, you have to understand Paul in a certain light, in a certain way. So p there are Hebrew roots that are trying to defend Paul. There's other camps that um give up on paul and say paul is the man of lawlessness or paul is the antichrist or whatever because paul brings us into lawlessness and encourages us to bail on god's way of life he wanted for us um hmm. so, so you they got were just leaving like the gospels at that point the gospels yeah the some of them Revelation. some of them just say no paul at all just the gospels and the torah or the hebrew bible Interesting. Um, it's a mess. Uh, but again, I never, I can't take credit. I never critically thought my way out of this stuff. I was like, the truth is here somewhere. I just have to listen to enough stuff and I have to whatever, pray enough and honor this lifestyle enough. And I'm mm. going to feel it more clearly and on and on and on and on. So, so what really uh, it's almost embarrassing and funny the way that my faith shattered in like a matter of minutes. So I was listening to a Hebrew roots teacher on YouTube, somebody um, that I had been listening to a lot. And he was on a live stream with someone else had a different YouTube channel. Um, this guy I hadn't run into yet called Christian truthers. He was Christian truthers back then, Justin, um, so I didn't know anything about this Justin or this Christian truthers, but I had been watching this other guy. So I'm just listening to their live stream. They're teaching on something. And it was one of those times where, you know, you're watching a video and you just happen to see, oh, this is from two years ago or three years ago or whatever you see. Oh, this is kind of old, but whatever. I want to listen to their teaching. Well, I catch a glimpse of one little comment in the, in the video's comments. This person says, um, Wow, it's such a shame that Justin fell away from the faith. He was such a great teacher. I wish I would have downloaded more of his teachings before he deleted them all or something like that. Mm. And so I, it was like, it was as if I was at the top of the roller coaster and then it started going down. Something happened where I'm like, 
So we, me and these Christian truthers can have everything figured out, can be in, can be observing Torah, can be trusting Jesus for our salvation, can be in the know on these conspiracy theories and these horrible ways that modern society is misled and satanic and whatever. We can know all this and then somebody can just like bail on it. So I didn't even have to know what happened with that, Justin, just for me to know that someone that we had it figured out, did we not have it figured out? And then he bails. That was enough. I was like, uh oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> There's something out there else for me to learn, and it can shatter for me too. So it it was crazy. Hmm. You you can find this, Justin. Now, have you heard of bullet holes in the Bible? Uh, I may have. It doesn't ring a bell, but I may have seen it on YouTube. Bullet holes in the Bible. So now, Ju it Justin has a new YouTube channel. Yes, it used okay. to be Christian Truthers, and I guess it was a whole thing where he went through his own deconstruction, deconversion, he deleted his stuff and he came back as bullet holes in the Bible. And now he takes cracks at the Bible always. It's, it's amazing stuff he puts out. Interesting. But, I'll, I'll put the link beneath our, our video. That's interesting. I'd love to see that. Yeah. So, so then, so that was, that was the, just the craziest feeling. So I was like, I don't even, I don't even know what happened, but something happened and that's enough that, so now I can't, how do I not, how do I not look into this? You know, how do I just, ah, la, 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 puppies and kitties. I don't want to know, you know, no, I have to know what else is out there. So then I find him, I find a bunch of other channels and you, um, <clears throat> wow. What really got my attention right at first, he breaks down how Jesus is an, an archetype of Dionysus, um, that Mark's gospel mimics um, Homer's writings. Um, just Justin Best? Yes. Okay, yes. I I didn't recognize YouTube name, but I've heard that. I've seen some of his yes. videos. Yeah, he's he's very cool. Yeah. Yes. Um, Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus is a copycat story um, from Bacchae. the Bacchae. Yep. Yeah. I like all this stuff, bam, 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 bam. I'm like, oh, okay, I can see that. I can see that. I can see that. Um, then mm -hmm. I found a uh, Rabbi Tovia Singer. You know him? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love his stuff. So I love. It breaks his my stuff heart that he's because... still a theist, but yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, but if the if the Bible can debunk itself, but that's and, and that comes from my my prior appreciation for Torah and Hebrew roots, you know, if you're going to use the Torah to debunk stuff later in the Bible, then it's, it's debunked in my book. It's, it's done. Hmm. So you weren't, you weren't tempted to say the, the New Testament isn't from God. It's just the Old Testament that's from God that like you weren't going back to a true Judaism in any way. <sighs> When I found Tovia Singer, I there was maybe like 36 hours that I was like, should I get on the Judaism boat? Like, is that is that what God had for us? And um, all these people tried to mess it up with the New Testament. So there was there was a little bit of time where I, I really loved all that Tovia Singer had to say. And I'm like, ah. but I uh, eventually I just thought, well, if. If so much of this can be debunked, then I'm guessing any other religion could possibly be debunked. So why should I put, you know, pour myself into anything else? Mm. So yeah. I hear you. I'm, I'm curious with just, and I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second. And this is not at all to sound snarky. Um, I just, I know that this is a question that's probably going to come up in some people's minds. Um, I'll start with myself, so I'll put myself in the same boat. So it's not directed at you. I grew up as you know, a, a basically a Baptist, called a Baptist. Moved toward more evangelical mainstream Christianity. Moved toward Calvinism, and then escaped. But you could say, well, you know, they were huge chunks. Some of them were you know decades long, but you still shifted. You got more information, and you shifted. 
with yours, <clears throat> you seem to have shifted a, a, a few more times, and some of them were a little bit faster. So I think the question that might come up in people's minds is, is atheism a phase? And are you going to shift to something else? What would you say to that question? You know, I'm, uh, you know what I'm saying? In other words, you keep you keep an open mind to new information, which is great. I, to hope, hopefully I do the same thing. But with new information, it shifts your worldview considerably. Um, the question come, I think has come up to a lot of people in different contexts is like, is this a phase? Is this just you either, you know, to use the joking one, you just want to sin, but more just, you know, it's, it's a confusion. You know, people say you, you grew up in the wrong church. You, you got exposed. You didn't hear God speaking to you, whatever. But yeah, with enough bad theology and enough bad experiences, I can see why you need to step away from this for a while. That mm. doesn't invalidate it. It just means you had some really bad teachings. You need to get some good teachings. Um, atheism, if, if it's if it's the next stop, stop, as long as you you know the end of your train trip doesn't, as long as that, that's not the final stop. Even if it's the penultimate stop, the final stop needs to be obviously returning to Christ. Um, is this a phase? And would you, what would you say to someone who, who says they, they predict you're going to come back to the Lord in a few years? Um, I, I don't even know if I call myself an atheist. I feel like, um, <clears throat> wow. Um, I've had these weird sci-fi type thoughts of like, maybe there's a jerky God out there that didn't give us any information and we're just left here waffling trying to figure stuff out um so i i guess i call myself agnostic that way because i'm i'm still kind of tortured with sci-fi type possibilities of <laughs> what could be true yeah um but i with the crazy journey i've been on i i wouldn't deny that this might be a phase because I've made such pivots that I never expected myself to do. So why not go somewhere else? You know, I don't know, but I know that if, if the truth is so friggin' hard to find out, then how true is it? You know, like, why does it take so much work to nail down the truth? If, if it takes so much work for me, um, I don't really think it's true. <laughs> Yeah. or or the the being in charge um isn't worthy of i mean that sounds blasphemous uh, well blasphemy is very welcome on this channel <laughs> i know i know i'm trying to i want to phrase things to where i'll really be understood um i i don't ever see human sacrifice ever making sense to me ever again yeah um the blood magic um i don't that doesn't make sense and i don't ever see how it could ever again yeah so i don't see how to come back and i and i have been accused of oh you got distracted by this extra stuff you know on the on the outer rings of the bullseye and you needed to um just stay focused on christ and <laughs> I counter that by saying, no, Christ was never up for debate. Ever, ever, ever was he up for debate. I I protected him. He was he was there. And I thought, if this is true, then I'm holding on to this center, but I'd like to figure this other stuff out. Like if if there is ultimate truth, then we should be able to pinpoint. Is that true or is that true? Like something is going to be true and something's going to be false. Why is that so ridiculous for me to try to figure out? Mm. <clears throat> so if, if the truth is so hard for me to figure out, I I'm not so sure that there is ultimate truth. It, it's, if it's too hard for me to hang on to, I'm, I don't know. Yeah. I would just completely applaud that and, and add to it that at the same time as well, it just seems like the fingerprints all over this thing in terms of like the ev looking at it from an evidence perspective, like what's the evidence leading to, um, which hopefully is more of a, you know, the, the backdrop of, of all these discussions as we're trying to change our minds to say, 
I just want to pursue the truth. Where does the evidence lead us the, the actual truth? And we become more sensitive and aware of, of what is good evidence, what's bad evidence. But in, in light of that, it's like, if it's so difficult to figure out what the truth is of this, of, of, of what, what does this God really want and how do we interpret it? But then on top of it, like, why does it look like the fingerprints look so intensely like it's just mostly tribal men, arguably very nasty tribal men who are making this stuff up? Like, why does it look like it's just their story? And then when you get into stuff like you mentioned with uh, Justin Best's uh, information and other stories like that you could add to it of like saying, well, it looks like they're copying even the Yahweh stories from other places. And it looks like the Yahweh story evolved, like he used to be the son of Elion and Asherah. And how did that play out? Why is Asherah no longer part of the story? And why is Elion and why are Elion and Yahweh conflated later? It, and you eventually get to a point where you're just like, this looks, if, if you were to start instead of saying, God wrote this book, therefore the Bible, and look at how amazing it is, look at his love letter to us. But if instead you were to start with the premise and say, a bunch of tribal men who were trying to have a lot of power over each other's tribes and over the women in the, in the tribe, they were trying to dominate their world and gain power by way of saying there's a higher power that's communicating to me. What would that look like? And you're like, that's exactly what this book would look like. Mm -hmm. And all the evidence just to me just keeps on pointing to this looks like a very heavily evolved, heavily mythologized book starting from even ancient Egypt and ancient Mesopotamia, like this stuff evolved and kept changing. And once you, once you, it feels to me like once you get a certain amount of information, and I know you, like you've said, you, you keep on getting more information and hopefully we all do, but I think there's a certain amount of information that I would just lump into the idea of comparative mythology. I know that's, that's, that's more to it than that, but when you really get into comparative mythology, where you understand that this all these stories that, that were they meant so much to us but all these stories had a different origin they used to be slightly different and they used to be slightly different they slightly you know different names and different outcomes and that they got changed over and over and over and when you realize like the ancient origins of it pre yahweh and then when you add into it in my opinion how it got shifted through the early church history where you know like you, you mentioned you know Paul and people arguing is Paul, uh, you know, really telling the truth in his in his epistles. But then you you just go to some even more basic questions of did Paul actually write all of these letters or just some of them? Well, if he didn't write all of them, then who wrote the rest? And why don't we know for sure? There's there's no way, obviously, any of us can know for sure any of those answers. But once you realize that it it looks like it hasn't really been preserved very well and safely it just opens up Pandora's box. I think that to me, that's one of the biggest things I would add to your answer is if this whole thing is Pandora's box, if there's a God, he could have done so much better and he just didn't. Therefore, if, if, I, if this is a phase and I'm going to come back to something, there needs to be some really good evidence. And based on where I'm sitting now and keep learning more and more, the evidence for it being from a God just keeps falling apart. I mean, if, if I had, I've said this before, but if I had a thousand reasons to deconvert at the beginning, I feel like I've now got 20, 30, 40, 50,000 more answers, or more reasons to, to stay deconverted. The answers aren't moving me back toward the Bible at all. They're moving me further away from it um, in the sense of believing it as a worldview. Does that make sense? Yes. What's ironic is you, you, um, you put pressure on yourself to like, there's God's word and there's man's word. Like, Come on, Kelsey, care about God's word and not man's word. So that was part of the journey was like, wait a second, this verse says this, um, you know, excuse me, I need someone's help on, I need a man's help or woman's help. I need a person's help to understand this verse. I need man's word to help me understand God's word it's this weird, okay, now what exactly is from God and what exactly is not trustworthy? Uh, and then you, you realize, oh, okay, it's, it's all coming from people. Like I'm trusting, how much trust are you, you're putting it, you're putting trust in Paul or whoever was, was posing as Paul. 
um, you're putting trust in Moses, or they say, I've listened to scholars say Moses did, they don't even think Moses wrote, oh, but you're putting trust in these ancient hands writing this stuff, and then translators, and then, you know, councils deciding that this deserves to be in the canon and this does not. Um, let's translate this this way instead of that way. There's so much trust in man. When mm. when I really just wanted to trust God, how how do I just sign up to trust God and that's it? Yeah. Um, but you can't. You, there's no, I don't see how I can tr- just trust man's, I mean, God's word without it requiring all this trust in man. And that's where it just snaps in half and it's just, it's just over. I just can't. So I've heard someone say, I don't know if you've joked about it or somebody joked about it. Why can't someone just, why can't God just write something on the moon? <laughs> like, like, can't he just like show up big enough, personally enough for all of us? But instead it's all these councils and translators and, and then, and, you know, and then you have people like Rabbi Tovia Singer saying, um, no, they mistranslated virgin. It wasn't virgin. It's young woman. And then, whoa, that changes stuff. So wait, Jesus wasn't really prophesied about coming from a virgin. Like, so you're just, you have to trust so many people in order to get mm. God's word. It's, it's very ironic and it's kind of ridiculous and tiring. Yeah, and you realize eventually that you're you're listening to not men's interpretation of God's word, but men's interpretation of other men's words, and it it really it, it's it's crazy when you kind of come to a post mortem of it all, but you're like, you know what? I've been listening to dead men this whole time. That's what this whole thing is about. I've just been listening to dead men my whole life, and you're like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> you dead men do not need to speak into my worldview anymore. Yeah, it's, and and you, I'm grieving, I'm mourning lost time and like lost Mm -hmm. time that I could have been, you know, taking care of myself and paying attention to how I want to live life and which directions I want to go regarding any topic at all. That's just, that's just robbed from me. I just, because I, I wasn't, I didn't allow myself to care about what I wanted. That's, that's absolutely irrelevant. Go to the word or go to prayer and get the answer on what he wants you to be doing next. I'm just a soldier. And if I don't listen and obey, someone else is going to step into my place and do what he wants, <clears throat> do what he wants done. Yeah. There, there is, there might as well not be me but he loves me and it's this back and forth, but he loves me, but he doesn't need me, but he loves me, but he, and, and now, excuse me. Now I'm learning to actually think through topics and decide what does Kelsey think about that? What does Kelsey feel about that? Uh, It's, it's okay for me to actually, have my own thought processes and feelings about things and that's been very crazy to try to navigate now Mm. it feels like you're kind of alluding to the topic there of you know religious trauma and recovering from it and yes i feel like it's that's such a big thing and i wanted to get into it with you so let's use this as a segue to that but you know when you look at this Yahweh character with all of his, you know, psychopathic nastinesses, you know, I'll love you so much, but you know, if you cross me, I'm going to kill you forever. And I love you unconditionally with so, so many conditions. It's like, this guy is a whack job character, but we loved him and we were taught to love him. And, and it's like the Stockholm syndrome thing. Like when you escape, you realize, yes, the Bible, yes, it's just a bunch of dead men speaking to us, but at the same time, we felt like the Yahweh character was real and Jesus was real. You know, all these other people be damned, but Jesus was real. God was real. He was our father. And when you realize he's not a good father, like he, if, if he could have been real, mm-hmm. we would have needed to philosophically fight him, not love him. Um, he's a psycho. And it's, it's repeatedly described the way, you know, he, he tells people to stone their own children. He commands Abraham to be willing to sacrifice Isaac. He's into genital mutilation. He commands child brides and, and genocide and so forth. He's a really nasty character, but we loved him. And that Stockholm syndrome, you know, who was my captor? Why did I love my captor so much? 
how did you weave through not just the is this mythology or not yes it's mythology but why did i love this guy why did i love this religion so much i mean that you know we would have called it a relationship of course but why did i love my relationship with this character so much when he's obviously not a good character i guess i'm still i don't even know it was just reality mm. he was just he was just in charge and um he wanted those people to live a certain way and he gave permission to wipe these people out wipe those people out. like what he wants is good um and that was just my reality i was just so surrendered to him being in charge and i couldn't think outside of it mm. i i'm still processing yeah i think I, i'm definitely the same way i feel like <laughs> every day is some version of that that you know pops up you find there's roots of this stuff in your psyche that you have to keep pulling up there's a verse in proverbs that talks about um I think you kind of alluded to this concept, but um, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. But, you know, that that little part in the middle, don't lean on your own understanding. How have you learned to just like listen to your own self-talk and to establish your own identity and just be like, you know what, I'm going to trust my gut instinct and I'm going to listen to my body more. Like, how does that play out for you? I'm still working it out. I think it's just naturally happening. It's just... I, I noticed that my imaginary friend is no longer in the room. Mm. And at first, at first that was absolutely heart wrenching, but now it's actually so freeing because, you know, like, so for an example, my kids are sitting there um, with me in the room and I'm supposed, I need to talk to them about whatever they did wrong or something. Well, in the past, you know, he was right here and I, and I have to, um, okay. So kids, um, we shouldn't act this way because the Bible says, you know, or, or whatever, just trying to function in life with, with flesh and blood in front of me, but my imaginary friend is right here and I'm, he's the most important hmm. and that is messed up and now it's gone. So, so now I can actually, he's just gone. And now I can look at the flesh and blood children in front of me and actually process like the looks on their faces, care about the looks on their faces and how they seem to be processing what I'm saying or what they, what they emotionally seem to be needing from me in this moment. I can actually connect to that. And it's crazy. It's, I can actually care about the flesh and blood people in front of me. So I, I think it's just naturally happening because he's not lurking there anymore. Mm. That's I love the way you put that. I, I don't think I could have put it better, but I would say a parallel thought to me is like, I don't, I don't ever find myself praying anymore. Like even if there's a, you know, close call of an accident, like, Oh, I almost got hit. Oh, thank God. God, thank you for protecting me. Or, Oh dear God, I hope that doesn't happen. Like you just, the vocabulary starts to die. Obviously, we all kind of say stuff, you know, like, you know, God bless you or something when someone sneezes. We all say bless you by accident, whatever. But it's like the actual like mental, emotional vocabulary starts to just drown out and you mm -hmm. just don't find yourself thinking about it. And I love that the way you describe it as an imaginary friend. And eventually you just realize, you, know, you look back at a certain point and you're like, I just don't think about it anymore. Like I just, that person's just not part of my psyche at all, um, that, that character. And I, it's such a, it's a healing thing. Sometimes you, I, I don't think we all realize when the healing is necessarily happening, but you just look back at a certain point and say like, I just don't think about it. I just, it just, and I think honestly, I think about it more because I do these interviews, but I think apart from a lot of the interviews I do, if I weren't constantly hearing people's stories and asking questions and so forth, a lot of this stuff would just be like, I'm just focused on whatever art, music and nature and, you know, health, you know, I'm just living my life. And it's, it's, um, you know, it's an honor obviously to do interviews, but I think the, the goal would be for a lot of people that don't go the route that I'm doing is just to truly like, just go live your life now, just, you know, reclaim your identity and start living the life that you could have had this whole time that hopefully you still have some great memories of, you know, your life before, but just to say like, whatever time I've got left, I'm going to be me for the first time. Um, it's, it's awesome. You mentioned your kids. I did want to move us toward a wrap up by asking about how that played out. 
how do you <laughs> raise your kids without uh, i mean i'll play devil's advocate again you know how how do you raise your kids without the you know the the word of god and the biblical morality you know how do you raise your kids to be good kids and to be healthy apart from jesus at first when my faith shattered i really felt like i was a danger to my kids i didn't want deconstruction and deconversion to be contagious to them i was mm. really scared of uh messing up their faith it, it, you know it was i still had to iron everything out so i felt like a danger and now as i ponder i get further away from it and i ponder more and more i really do want to be that fresh that breath of fresh air to them that gives them the okay to get out of it um mm -hmm. my husband still takes them to church and it's really um it's really to be with our family um have that social like community connection every week um so they're kind of my husband's kind of stuck in that um right now but uh i've i've gotten brave enough to have conversations <clears throat> recently with my kids where um i do say and i've heard you say um you tell your kids you're in charge of what you believe and what you think and you don't have to let anybody in here with mm. how to think how to believe and um i i've just recently gotten the guts to start talking like that um i That's think awesome. they can kind of smell it on me because i'm never at church now <laughs> they kind of smell it on me they'll they'll just kind of do you believe Adam and Noah and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah are really real? Or and I was like, huh, you know, um, so at first I tried to, I tried to vaguely answer, oh, well, a lot of people have different ways. They understand that some people think it's just stories, but other people think it's really literally true. Um, just recently I've, I had to get up the guts because they hit me with too many questions. I was like, you guys, I, I just, I don't know if I believe that stuff anymore. Um, I, I've just, a lot of things have changed in here and in here where it's just, I'm struggling to really make it make sense anymore. And I, I used, I recently, just the other day, I used the example. I'm like, you guys, when I was not to be disrespectful and call God Santa Claus, but really this was my example. I was like, guys, I remember a Christmas, I was maybe like seven years old or something. It's Christmas morning. I'm surrounded by all these great gifts that are supposed to be evidence for Santa, right? And I just remember thinking, the feeling is heartbreak. Like this, I really don't think that a cute old fat guy brought me all this stuff. And I remember feeling heartbroken, like, but I want to believe in Santa because I don't know Christmas any other way, you know, type of thing. So I'm like, I want to believe. Can I go? I remember thinking, can I go on believing still in Santa? No, I just, this just doesn't really fit together anymore. And I used that with my kids. I said, I'm at this place where I it's not making sense. The Bible, my past faith stuff is not really making sense right now. If someone had come up to me and said, but you have to believe in Santa, but you have to believe in Santa. I, I tried. I sat there and tr is there a way that I can keep believing? I really don't think so. So I'm like, guys, you can do the same with your own thoughts and your own feelings and your own beliefs about other things. If something doesn't fit together and make sense, you don't have to listen to other people telling you this should make sense. You should you should believe this. This should make sense because we're all different. We're all going to connect things and think of things and feel differently about things. Um, it might make sense. Things might make sense to you and they might not. And and that's just where I left it for now. Mm -hmm. So as far as you know, though, they they would still have at least a simple childlike faith in Christ at the moment my son gets pretty um passionate um mm -hmm. about there is there is a god how do you think we're 
how do you think we're here if there isn't a god and I'm like mm. i don't know there's some there's some different opinions on that i don't know um my daughter comes out and says there isn't a god mm. a little five-year-old um <laughs> that's awesome so I just let them be. I just, I just, hey guys, because they get a little passionate with each other. I'm like, hey guys, remember what we said? Some things are going to kind of make sense to one person and they're not really going to make sense to another person. You guys can just decide to believe how you want. And that's, that's where they're at right now. One believes and one doesn't. And I'm just going to let it be fluid and <laughs> just mm. see cool. what happens. I'm working on some some monologues that um, I've got a lot of them working on, but one of them is is a follow up. I did a video maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago, about how to protect kids' minds, and I'm I'm working on a follow up to that to kind of bring it up up to date for some other things that I've done. And you might you know enjoy that, but one of the things I would suggest um, to you or anyone in your shoes, and, and this is hard because it's, it's so much hard work behind this suggestion, so it may not be feasible, but to really get as much information about where they copied the Jesus character from, um, just in terms of, and I've said this before, so I apologize if it's, it's repetitive, but you know, Dionysius turns water into wine, so does Jesus. Hermes walks in the water with his golden slippers, so does Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, Zeus cries drops of blood and water, so does Jesus. Helios wears a purple robe and has the, 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 the sun rays around his head like a crown. Jesus wears a purple robe and has a crown of thorns. On and on it goes. There's a lot more, obviously, and just when you when you add those up, and you bring in the Homeric epic stuff that Justin Best talks about, and the way that they copied from the Old Testament, you know, Jesus is the new Moses, he's the new David, he's the new Elijah, Elijah, whatever, he's the new Israel. You add all these things up, and especially, I think it hit the the Greek mythology really hits. You know, gets you get a lot of money from <laughs> a lot of money shots from that one. But when you put those seeds, and it's to me, it's like if kids aren't ready to hear the the full reality of it, those little seeds just get planted. And I think too, just, just the reality that you're there, you're saying, you know, church is irrelevant to my life now. And I don't believe just the fact that that's a viable option. They don't have to take it, but they're seeing someone who's healthy, who is growing, who's loving and caring and, and a good person living a wonderful life without any God stuff. Like just your example alone, and and hopefully a little bit of information about mythology is enough to just you know plant that field, uh, plant the seeds in the field, and say you know what, you, you have enough information now to know that this sounds really fishy. If you want to stay at it, it's it's your mind, like you said, it's your life. But I will, I love this the idea of saying, I used to describe this a lot. I'll, I'll go back to it. Like if there's a table, like a big you know big big dinner table. And someone says, this is your worldview of Christianity. You need to place your faith in Christ. And this, that's, and I'm going to give you information as to why this, this is so important. And in the little, you know, far corner, they put all the reasons of where this came from, you know, the, you know, who, who, who put the Bible together, the canon from a Christian, you know, conservative Christian perspective. And then like the rest of the table is blank. And you're like, where's the other information? And where's the rest of it? And just to say, like, if you're going to, tell people swing out into eternity as it were or you at the cross of christ as your saving grace then at least swing out into eternity with the full knowledge of where this thing even came from and i i love that and i i love i'm working on some bigger projects it'll be a year or two but to try to even create a book uh, a video book and, and a real book where it just talked the parallels so even kids and i think adults would, would love it too but you know kids could literally see all these parallels um so anyway take that for what it's worth but i, I yeah love that i love that. that i love yeah. that um the other thing i wanted to comment on is biblical morality yeah um can you, can you still hear me okay yeah mm -hmm. okay so um <laughs> my dog um regarding biblical morality <clears throat> i also started pondering again it was never a reason to deconvert for me but I did ponder in parenthood, I pondered, which is more moral for me to teach my son um, not to kill someone because a being says not to? Or is it more moral for, for my son to actually just feel, no, I don't want to kill because I care about other people? Like, which is more moral? 
you know? So when you take that boogeyman out, I think there's actually room for more morality, like true morality, not that you're afraid of punishment or hell, but that you you want, just want to morally care about the good of others. Mm. And that's that seems to be a more moral lifestyle now that I'm out. I, that's makes more sense to me now. Mm. Do you think your loved ones and, and family understand that Christianity is in many ways a version of psychological child abuse? Like, do they take that seriously, what it means to tell someone you are wicked and there's a, someone looking into your brain and analyzing you at all times, like, and, and just distorting reality by leaps and bounds uh, in terms of what, you know, what happened in history and, you know, physically what's, what's in the actual universe. Do you think they get it? The, the psychological child abuse that's happening? No. Would they Would they call it that? No, not at all. Hmm. But, but I come from a Christian crowd that um, doesn't play up hell at all. Okay. Like, they, be- they believe that it's real, but we're not going to talk about it. So hmm. I guess if, if you if you brought brought it up to them that way, they would say, well, okay, I could see your point, but we don't even deliver the gospel that way. Like, we don't do that to kids. Hmm. Um, I got more serious about hell as an adult where I'm like, wait a second, if this is black and white true then why aren't we screaming about hell from the rooftops? Like, this is serious. Mm. Um, so so they would defend themselves and say, we don't play it up. I mean, but if it's true, according to the word of God, then it's true and there's nothing we can do about it. You can call it child abuse, but that's it's just ultimate reality. Yeah. I, I do make a point of uh, hell being an issue for my family my wife is still a fundamentalist Christian and I'll talk about it a lot with my kids where like when we're looking at something where people are really just nice people, I'll be like, I'll I'll point out to them, mama thinks they're going to burn in hell. And so for example, we watch this, they, they love this show. It's a vlog called J house where it's a Mormon family with like five or six kids and they're just sweet. And they were, their YouTube channel exploded. So they're probably making millions of dollars off of this. And so they can just spend their days going to Disney world filming it and, you know, make more money and they have more money now to go to somewhere else and go somewhere else. And so it's just kind of a cute, a loving family. They don't talk about Mormonism much. I mean, it's like 1% of, uh, if that, yeah, they're just a fun family, but they're Mormons. And I'll probably tell my kids like, mama even likes this show and you guys like this show and mama thinks they're all going to burn. And we've had some Catholic people do some nice things for us recently in the last year or two. And I'll be like, the Catholic, those Catholic people just did something really nice for us, didn't they? They were so giving. Mama thinks they're going to burn in hell. And I I don't say that to necessarily make it a dramatic issue, but in some ways it is. Like you realize they're, they're not saying hell up front, but they need to be honest. Like if you really believe that that's what's, what their stake, what's going to happen. And of course, bring it to the, to the actual like real life right now in my life, meaning for them, their, their world. Like you realize mama thinks you're going to burn in hell, right? And get, you get them to that point where they, they realize this isn't like a, you know, squishy, mushy, Jesus wants to be your special friend story. These are actual people who are threatening your eternal existence and they think that you deserve it. And uh, I was telling someone else, um, you know, when I was a Calvinist, I heard a pastor say uh, about a lady he counseled who had, um, she'd lost a baby, a young baby who had been born into the world. It wasn't a miscarriage, but it had been, it had been born. Uh, but then it died, you know, in the first year or two. And he pre- was preaching a sermon and he said, when I was counseling this lady through her grief, I told her, man, you got to think about it theologically. Your baby deserved to die like every baby does. Um, so you can't fight God and say, oh, this is horrible. Like, it's not horrible. Your baby was a sinner. It deserved death. Um, the fact that we any of us live at all is a grace from God. And so like, you realize this is what these people think about you. This is psychological child abuse. And to put it in front of them in those, I think occasionally in those dramatic terms, I think helps bring it to kids to say, this is actually like, in my, not their words, they wouldn't use these big words, but this is a psychological battle. Like we're in a psychological war for children's hearts and minds. And when you do this stuff to kids, like I know there's people that just are like, live and let live. If you want to be a Christian, I don't care. 
I'm, I know I'm not putting your words in your mouth here. This is my story, but um, saying from my perspective, if people want to tell me that they're okay with psychologically ch- abusing children, I'm going to fight them tooth and nail. Like I'm yeah. not going to let that happen. And it's it's big in my heart. I hate that it's happening, and I, I feel like protecting kids' minds has become one of my biggest burdens. And I love the fact that my my kids, um, I, I'll I'll occasionally say like, "Hey guys, you, you know that stuff's not real, right?" They're like. Daddy, you don't even have to tell us anymore. We know it's not real. Like it's it's just awesome. It's it's a it's an afterthought for them at this point. They go for this, they go for the crackers and the friends. So it, it definitely helps my heart to know that they're not being, you know, going through that psychological abuse that so many other, I mean, ki- literally kids sitting right next to them, believing it's all real, are being, in my opinion, abused. My kids, you know, have a, a bit of protection around them because of what I'm doing to help them escape. So anyway, I do want to wrap up by just asking. A question I ask a lot of people: um, How did you deal with losing the afterlife? Or oh do, wow! Do you feel like there is an afterlife potentially, and you just don't know what it is, or do you feel like it's probably not there? Um, I was bummed for maybe like two days. <laughs> okay. Uh, not being able to be reunited with certain people and stuff. Um, that was a bummer for a couple of days, but I just got over it and it it makes you live in the moment more like oh this this is really it like this is all the time I have with my loved ones I don't get whole other you know millennia with them like this this could be it so Mm -hmm. it just again makes you want to invest directly right now in the flesh and blood that is right in front of your face instead of living in this dream world of like oh we have heaven together forever um so it's it's actually been it was it was sad and now it's great to just be free and just be free to invest in people right now if you um, if you could have lived forever would you have wanted to i i did struggle with the whole like are we really going to be singing the whole time or i I guess I had faith again. I just like, okay, I trust you with this, that you're, you're going to allow me to like fly every once in a while. You're going to allow me to go do fun things every once in a while. And it's still, maybe we'll be singing while we're doing the fun things. Like I just had faith, like, okay, it's going to work out somehow, but it always kind of irked me. Like, really, we're, we're going to be worshiping the whole time. Um, Again, I, I never thought it through myself. It was always just, okay, I trust you with eternity. It it won't be super boring. I just trust you that it won't be super boring. <laughs> yeah. So so it, 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 would you say it was it was a bit of a shocker to to think that this might be it? Uh yeah. And uh, I'm I'm trying not to think about afterlife or other possibilities of other gods, religions, anything. I'm it's almost like a it what it has been in like an existential OCD, if I can call it that, where it's like that was that was huge for me when faith shattered. It was like, but what is all this about then? I'm looking around at everything going, why? What what is this then? It doesn't make any sense. So I'm I'm trying to get past that and just not think beyond my own life. I'm trying to just think about my own life and how to live it in a healthy way. And I'm trying to not even give into the existential OCD, I call it. Yeah. Hmm. I think it's one of the hardest parts of it all. And I've, I've, I've comfortably landed with, with nihilism that I, I don't think any of it matters, ever has, or ever will. But it really is hard to wrap your mind. Like when you've you, you've just had decades of there was very specific meaning and purpose, and everything counts for eternity, and to suddenly embrace the idea that maybe none of it ever counts, and and yet at the same time, you know, to live in a way that says I'm going to make it count for my kids, I'm going to make it count for my loved ones, I'm going to leave it better than I found it. That kind of stuff, you know, you practically live as if it matters, even though you know in the bigger picture, in the back of your mind, it it, it probably doesn't. But mm-hmm. you want it to, you know, you want it to matter, you know, even though it may not, you want it to matter. And I think that's one of the things that I, I've realized a lot is that Christianity 
destroys your ability to embrace reality, but it also, it, it both, it keeps you from grieving in the sense of like, when someone dies, you don't really grieve because you think you're going to see them again. But at the same time, when you actually leave it, it causes grief. It breaks your heart because you're like, wait, all this, it's like someone, you know, you mentioned Christmas. I'll go back, back there for the illustration. Like someone says to you, like say you were, you know, grown up with a sibling and your sibling says, Hey, I saw your secret pile of presents and you got like a hundred presents and they're awesome. I saw mom and dad wrapping them. You got some crazy stuff. You will never believe what they got you this year. And the next day Christmas arrives and you find out that, you know, the paycheck had been cut and there was no money for anything. And you got like one little sweater and that's it. That's your Christmas is one little gift that you really didn't want. And you're like, like, this is it? Like, really? Like, this is kind of horrible. And you realize that Christianity, when you, when you're done with it, it broke your heart. Like the, the experience of leaving broke your heart. And you're like, this was my father. Like, this wasn't my, like my cold, distant father. Like this was my, my daddy, not to be disrespectful to the father figure concept, but like, this was my daddy and Christianity tricked me into thinking I had a daddy and a future with him forever. And it's never been real, not for a minute. And it, it, it's quite a grieving process. It's amazing that, you know, the stuff, and I, I know people go through angry atheist phases. Um, I don't know if you went, got angry at all or if you've been angry so far, but it's amazing the emotional phases and it's, it's, it's cool. It's fun to go through in some ways it's an adventure, but there, there are days where it's like, wow, like this did a, this did a number on me. Yeah. I was really angry for a little bit. Just again, the sci-fi thoughts of like, who's in charge? Cause if someone is in charge, um, they didn't give me anything trustworthy to really go by, like mm. to, to govern my life by. Um, like I said, God, I, I don't have reliable God's word. I have to trust all these men for it. Um, so I, I was angry about someone possibly being in charge and not giving me clear information, clear anything. I, I was angry about that. Um, but then you just kind of realize, well... I'm I'm the one suffering with that anger and bitterness, so I guess I'll move on. <laughs> There's nothing. I just have to be healthy and move on from it. But I was angry. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think too. Just you mentioned before that just realizing you lost some time and the idea of wanting to reclaim it. And I, I think it's even a verse about that of redeem the time. And it's like you know, obviously not from a biblical perspective now, but we want to redeem the time we've got and make it make it worth it and. In some ways, you know, once you get past some of the harder parts of the healing process, life does get more beautiful. It really does because you realize that, you know, you're number one, you're much freer than many. I mean, generations and generations before us were stuck in this. And if, if they if they became atheists, you know, hundreds of years ago, they would have probably faced ostracization or death. And it's like we're we live in this world in a society now where at least we have the option to to pursue the truth for real. And so that's that's awesome. And just to realize like that now we're free and like we can, we can look at, so I, lo I lo love the idea of just looking up at the stars at night or a beautiful sunrise or sunset and just thinking, I'm just looking at it and I'm not connecting it in the slightest to Yahweh or Jesus. I'm just, mm -hmm. just to be in the moment, just look at the stars and don't, don't do anything, but just breathe them in. And it's, it's really cool. It's, it's a good, it's a, it's a fun journey, but. So just to wrap up, I wanted to uh, pass the ball back to you one final time and just say, do you have any final thoughts for uh, for our audience, especially for anybody who's you know going through some similar thoughts or phases as to what we've talked about? Do you have any parting words for us? Uh, I guess I would encourage that you, you are not alone. Um, it may feel that way, but you're not alone. You can... <clears throat> you can reach out and find plenty of people like us that really were... Um, reeling from all this and have dealt with the heartbreak are dealing with the heartbreak and we we can connect um you're not alone in that mm. and um for people who are considering and kind of waffling in all this i recommend um just staying just try staying inside the bible and exploring how it debunks itself because i i remember think i remember realizing that what there are biblical scholars that who are not believers like i know not to listen to them then you know I, you know that as a believer like don't listen to the non-believers about the bible um so if you're uncomfortable with opening yourself up to that world 
Um, I recommend just like I, I love Rabbi Tobia Singer, just opening yourself up to just stay in the Bible, but look at how it contradicts itself. And I, I think that will rescue you out of the whole thing and just settle it for you. Mm-hmm. But That's a good way to put it. Yeah. It's, I've, I've seen some memes of something like that, like the, 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 path atheism is is paved by you know people that were reading their bibles very carefully something like that yeah and that's that's what i say my final my final prayer to yahweh was you've seen my devotion <laughs> like you've seen my desire to be absolutely obedient and absolutely surrendered and on and on and on and on so you also see my brain and what it's been through and what it's struggling with. So if you're real, I'm just going to trust you to save me anyway, because, because you said you would, you said, I can't work for my, for my salvation. Then don't make me work for it now. You know, because, Mm -hmm. because belief for me would be extreme work because it does not make sense. And I refuse to work for my salvation. I I'm, I've been told, we can't work for our salvation. Our righteousness is as filthy rags, right? Then fine, rescue me anyway, because of how devoted I have been and the depth of my belief before. Mm. Rescue me because I'm not, I refuse to work for my salvation. I refuse to work for belief. That was my last prayer. It was like, you, you, you see, you see this right here and I I just got to be done. So I'm, I'm free. I'm done and mm. whatever. I completely agree. It, it is, it's, you realize that the, the cries of your heart, either the literal cries or, or just the metaphorical cries of your heart are, are falling on deaf ears. And it's, it's amazing when you, when you finally kind of say to yourself, I haven't been talking to anybody this, this, this whole time. I've been talking to myself. And you realize like all these cries of God, please show up, please, you know, do the, do the fleece, you know, like Gideon or whatever, show mm. me, prove that you're here. Um, prove, you know, speak. This is like, this is crunch time. Show up big and move these big rocks. And it's like, he never does it. And there's a reason he never does it. It's because he's not there. You've been talking to the drywall this whole time. And it's once you realize that you're like, Oh, Tim, that's heartbreaking. Once you realize you're like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done with this. And that's why I, I think it's funny. Apologists, I I don't get too many people that ask me, hey, you know, can you do a debate? I think people get that my channels for people that have kind of done that. I respect the channels that do the debates. I think it's great that some channels really thrive on that. But I'm kind of at a spot where I'm like, we're this is kind of a channel for people that are kind of done. Like we're done with this. This that discussion's kind of over. We're not going to discuss, you know, whether or not the, the Yahweh is real. We're going to discuss how to reclaim your identity and how to heal. Now that we we are very much uh, convinced that none of this has ever been real, and I I love this you know thinking to myself, we're not we're not here to trigger people and to say maybe you need to go back to Christ maybe you don't like we're here to tell people no you you made a really healthy choice you did learn a lot of stuff now that you're back to you know you're you're counted it all as a loss like Philippians would have said I count it all as a loss um, but you're back to square one you're back to zero now let's start to build something special. And I, I love that. I love that people, for the first time, I think, have a chance to say, "It's it's time to, to open my eyes." Like in the, you know the the Matrix, you know Neo opens his eyes for the I first love time. That. <laughs> it's like you never used them before. Well, all right. Well, now I'm going to use them. I'm going to use my eyes for yep. the first time for real. So, mm-hmm. well, I know I, I asked a lot of questions. I really appreciate you sharing your story. This has been great. Um, I would love you. You're one of the few people that I think I've at least that I'm aware of that has said that your deconversion is fairly recent. I think you said nine months ago from the time mm-hmm. of our interview today. I would love to catch up with you again in a year or two and just kind of see how it's going. Um, if you tell me that you returned back to Christianity, even if it's that bizarre, I want to hear about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I'm saying that tongue in cheek, of course. But I, I'd, love to, I'd love to hear how your journey goes, and especially in light of your kids. So please do reach out again at some point and, you know, okay. tell me how it's going, and especially if you have anything topical in your mind. But this has been great. Thank you so much for, for your vulnerability and sharing your story. Thank you for having me, and thank you for all you do. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, well, I'll just wrap up by then by saying we've been speaking with Kelsey Gallert. Kelsey, thank you so much. Great to hear your story. Thank you. Bye-bye.